So thank you all for, uh, for joining. This is, um, I think, an exciting opportunity to get folks together and have a conversation about an incredibly important issue. Um, it's also uh, a very timely moment for us to be getting together. Um, just a few days ago, after years of hard work by lots and lots of people, the world came together um, in Paris and uh, came together around a historic and ambitious and enduring agreement to take real action on climate change. The agreement is a tribute to American leadership, to the president's leadership. Uh, it's also a tribute to American innovation. Um, the set of targets and goals that uh, were agreed upon are possible and will be possible uh, because of businesses, because of scientists, engineers, uh, innovators, and investors working together um, to unlock the set of technologies that are needed for us to meet uh, the challenge of a changing climate. But Paris is also a reminder of all the work uh, we still have left to do. And just in the same way that investment and innovation uh, are going to be powering our ability to meet bold emissions targets, uh, they're going to be critical ingredients to our ability to adapt to a changing climate. And that's why we're gathered here together uh, today, just a few days after the Paris Agreement, uh, to see how we can deploy that successful innovation playbook that we've seen in the mitigation technology space into the adaptation arena. Uh, for the Obama administration, this is a proven playbook. Uh, just five years ago, I remember the skepticism we faced when we launched uh, the SunShot initiative. Um, we said we would make solar cost competitive with fossil fuels by 2020. But innovators and investors rose to the challenge and partnering with the federal government, we're, uh, the price of solar is less than half from when the initiative began. And last year alone, solar installations climbed 30%. Uh, there are nearly 200,000 jobs in the sector, and solar jobs are growing uh, at a pace that is 10 times faster uh, than the rest of the economy. So uh, today's goal is to see how we can take the learnings from that uh, approach and apply that strategy of deploying the technologies we have um, and laying the foundation for game-changing breakthrough technologies uh, in the adaptation sector. And in particular, we're tackling uh, an issue that uh, is inescapable, and that is the uh, challenge around water resources. Um, it, it was uh, remarkable how many rooms uh, the conversation around water uh, cropped up in uh, as we were uh, negotiating in Paris, um, and there's a, there's a certain irony in the fact that we live on this blue marble, uh, and uh, water is such a significant issue for communities already, for so many communities around the United States and around the world. Uh, that is not something that's going to change, uh, and in fact, climate puts uh, additional pressure on those water resources. Uh, fortunately, we have a way to respond uh, through innovation. Uh, we can pioneer the solutions and the technologies uh, that are going to help us adapt. So with that, um, I'd like to invite for uh, some opening remarks uh, the President's Chief Science and Technology Advisor, someone who was also over in Paris the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I'm sure uh, also found that uh, adaptation, resilience, uh, and in particular the challenges around water resources were front of mind uh, for uh, folks all around the world. Um, and this is going to be a, a, a critical part of the discussion going forward. Dr. Holdren.
Well, thank you, Ali, and uh, thanks to the whole teams at OMB, CEQ, OSTP, and the relevant agencies who've helped uh, pull this all together today. It really is a pleasure to be here to help open a discussion of uh, challenges around water and how innovation can address them. Uh, for about 36 years, I taught a course on environmental science and policy, uh, first at Berkeley and then at Harvard. In the first lecture, I always told the students that the numbers aren't everything. The physical dimensions of a problem are never the whole story, but they're uh, usually an important part of the story. And so I want to start this morning by putting the water issue in a quantitative global context with a few numbers. I hope this doesn't cause too many eyes to glaze over. Um, but I start with the fact that global runoff uh, of fresh water, that's precipitation minus evaporation, amounts to about 50,000 cubic kilometers of fresh water per year. Uh, about a sixth of that, by the way, falls on North America, Mexico, uh, United States, and Canada combined. Um, I should say that a cubic kilometer is a billion cubic meters, and a cubic meter is 264 gallons, if you want to convert those numbers uh, to more familiar units. But the key point I want to make about this overall number of 50,000 cubic kilometers of runoff is that three quarters of it is lost either uh, because it's geographically unavailable or because it's lost to storm runoff. And so we're actually left for human use a runoff of about 12,000 cubic kilometers per year. The interesting thing is that of that amount, around 2010, humans were already withdrawing for human use 5,000 cubic kilometers out of the 12,000, 42 percent of the total available freshwater runoff on the planet was already being used by humans uh, around, uh, around 2010. And of those withdrawals, uh, 5,000 uh, cubic kilometers a year, 70 percent was for agriculture worldwide. Fraction in the United States a little higher than that, closer to 75 percent. 20 percent was for industry, 10 percent was for domestic use, residential uses of water, and interestingly enough, only a tenth of a percent was for drinking. Humans drink five cubic kilometers of water per year, a tenth of a percent of the 5,000 that we withdraw. U.S. withdrawals per person at about 2,000 cubic meters per person per year are twice those of Italy, they're four times those of China, and they're 40 times those of Nigeria per person, just to put these things in some perspective. Water issues in the United States obviously have very strong regional and local dimensions. Runoff and reservoir storage are highly uneven. Most decisions about water allocation and management in the United States are made by state, local, and tribal authorities who know and understand the needs of their communities and regions. But the stakeholders and the authorities who are on the front line of dealing with existing and emerging stresses on the water system don't always have the information they need. They don't always have the tools they need to deal with water challenges. And that's one of the reasons that there's an important role for the U.S. federal government to play in supporting those decision makers, not least by funding research and development that harnesses American ingenuity and innovation to help overcome the water challenges that some regions of the United States are experiencing already. And that brings me to the theme of today's meeting, which is the role that innovative technologies and innovative practices can play in addressing water issues. And I want to spend just a few minutes framing uh, that set of challenges uh, in the context of uh, climate change, uh, how climate change is uh, exacerbating uh, a number of the challenges that we face in the water domain. There are six specific aspects of climate change I want to mention that have significant impacts on the hydrologic cycle and the human uses of its flows for the purposes that I just mentioned. Those impacts vary by region, naturally. Everything in this domain varies by region. But in general, in a warming world, we can expect, first of all, increased evaporation from soil, from lakes, from reservoirs and rivers, which decreases the availability of fresh water. Secondly, we can expect shifting patterns in the atmospheric circulation that together with uneven warming and uneven evaporation 
will alter the geographic distribution of water availability. Thirdly, more moisture in the atmosphere overall, the fact that a warmer atmosphere can hold more water, means more water can come down at once. And we are already seeing this in an increase in torrential downpours. Uh, that in turn increases losses to storm runoff, never mind the flooding effects, but it increases the fraction of water that is lost to storm runoff. A fourth effect is that more precipitation in the mountains is falling as rain rather than as snow. That reduces snowpack and thus summer and fall runoff from snowmelt that many communities and many ecosystems uh, depend on. Another factor, of course, is early melting of the snowpack in the spring, earlier melting of the snowpack in the spring, again, reducing fall and summer runoff. And finally, in some parts of the world, temperature-induced shrinkage of the mountain glaciers that feed many of the world's great rivers. Those impacts all impose stresses on the water system. They uh, can increase withdrawals. They cause slower recharge rates for groundwater aquifers, reductions in surface water available for human and ecological uses, the uses that ecosystems make of water, which we dare not forget. And also, uh, often reductions in water quality, which come from the same amount of pollution but lower flow in which to uh, dilute it. And that's just the supply side, of course. On the demand side, we have a situation where as demand for water rises, it becomes harder to maintain local supplies in the face of competing demands, demands of power plant cooling, of industry, of residences, of agriculture. And of course, as I just suggested, local demands for water for all of these purposes have to be balanced against the need to leave water in the system to support the health of the ecosystems that live there and on which we depend for a wide variety of services. The infrastructure for transporting, storing, and distributing water is also under multiple stresses, including those from climate change, the effects of climate change on the water infrastructure itself, or on infrastructures like electric power and telecommunications that the water systems depend on. It's been estimated that an average of 16 percent of U.S. water is lost due to leaks and inefficiencies in the water infrastructure, which is an amount equivalent to the water demand in our 10 largest cities in the United States. A lot of loss to leakage. And that, of course, brings me back to the theme of the roundtable today, which is how innovation can help us in dealing with the supply side, the demand side, and the infrastructure aspects of the water challenges I just mentioned, all the more demanding because of climate change. Let me give just a couple examples of the potential contribution of innovation. Better sensors that allow public utilities commissions and other stakeholders to quickly detect and repair leaks in water infrastructure. Those could dramatically cut the 16 percent losses that I just mentioned. Innovative materials for pipes and coatings could prevent leaks and weaknesses of other sorts from occurring in the first place. Uh, innovation in the design of appliances and other equipment that use water uh, can boost water end use efficiency. There are numerous opportunities for combining new technology with the Internet of Things to leverage even greater efficiencies. This past September, the administration announced a new Smart Cities initiative that will invest over $160 million to help address key challenges and transform energy and resource use in our cities. And of course, that's going to include water. I think we're going to find there's going to be uh, really enormous potential uh, to optimize water use in the urban environments of today and of tomorrow. On the supply side, innovation will help us tap additional and non-traditional sources of water, brackish groundwater, municipal wastewater, urban and agricultural runoff. Uh, waters produced from oil and gas operations to help uh, meet overall demand. And it's important to know, to understand, that technology to do much of that already exists. We already have a lot of the needed technology. Water recycling is already common for purposes like irrigation and power plant cooling uh, all across the United States. But we need innovation and we need entrepreneurship to build on the technologies that we already have. One way innovation can contribute is in the scaling up 
of some of the existing technologies, the facilitation of their broader adoption. We need innovation and entrepreneurship to help us pair existing technologies with the water resources we already have to better address the water stresses that we're already facing. And we need innovation to develop new technology that can provide water at lower costs. Interesting to consider desalination, which everybody wants to talk about in the context of the water issue. Uh, I will note again in the quantitative domain that global desalting capacity today in 2015 is about 25 cubic kilometers per year. That's five times the global drinking water need, but it's 1 20th of the domestic use uh, globally, and it is 1 150th of the water use in agriculture. Fresh water produced via the desalination methods available today is four times more expensive, requires three times more electricity, and emits or leads to the emission of twice the level of greenhouse gases associated with traditional water supply. New innovative technologies clearly could help close that gap, and this uh, will be certainly an important focus of research and development in the water space going forward. That innovation will also be needed to dispose in sustainable ways of the concentrated brines that result from uh, desalination systems. I think we all understand, though, that no one technology, no one innovation will be a silver bullet for the water challenges facing our nation and indeed countries around the world. Just as this administration has adopted an all of the above approach to clean energy, an all of the above approach is going to be required to ensure a secure and sustainable water future. And that approach will have to be grounded in integrated science-based decision making at regional scales and again within the context of a changing climate. The approach will need to be strongly informed by the expertise and the needs of a broad range of stakeholders at the state, local, and tribal levels, and in the public, private, nonprofit, and academic sectors. That's why the White House organized this roundtable today, not just to talk at you, but to talk with you. And we certainly uh, don't plan to stop this kind of engagement with today's event. In fact, I'm pleased to announce that my office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, together with other components in the Executive Office of the President, will be hosting a White House Water Summit on March 22nd of 2016, which is World Water Day, to continue the dialogue that we will be having today. In the lead up to that water summit, we're calling for commitments from the private sector and other stakeholder groups that will advance innovative solutions to water issues. My staff has already initiated discussions with many of the people in this room to help inform that summit, and we're looking forward to continuing to work closely with all of you in the lead up to that event in March. So thanks again to all of you uh, participating in today's roundtable. Uh, I look forward uh, to hearing uh, about the results of these discussions. I won't be able to stay for much of it, but um, it is uh, now a great pleasure, and I will stay for her to introduce the Secretary of Interior, Sally Jewell. Her bio uh, is in your folders. She is doing a fabulous job as the Secretary of Interior. It's a huge pleasure for me to have her as a colleague. Sally. Thank you, John. And uh, welcome to all of you today. There's a lot of people hanging out there. You want to come into the room, or do you just want to be hanging in the hallway? Oh, you want to hang in the hallway? OK, what, whatever. Uh, <laughs> as you wish. So it's great to be here, and I want to thank uh, my colleague, Ali Zaidi at uh, OMB for his really hard work on this, and his teammates, uh, Shara and Min, who've been working hard on this, as well as uh, colleagues at OSTP and uh, CEQ. We're full of alphabet soup here in the federal government, Office of Science and Technology Policy, Office of Management and Budget, uh, Council on Environmental Quality. Um, I represent the Department of the Interior, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of why we're here, which may not be obvious to everyone, but I do want to say that one of the reasons we're here is that we have a lot to do with water, and uh, my right arm in the department broadly, and particularly on water issues, is Deputy Secretary Mike Connor, and you'll be hearing from him a little bit later. He's ably assisted by a senior counselor in his hallway, and that's Letty Beelan. Just wave Letty so that they see you. And, um, 
we also have with us uh, kind of the architect from our side of a lot of these efforts, and, and that is uh, Tom Eisman. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science. Tom's in the back there. So uh, those are the go-to people if you find them on breaks and so on and you have questions. And, of course, Mike will be up here uh, in a little bit with uh, uh, more comments on, on a panel discussion. So uh, water is a huge challenge in this country, and I think we all know that. And we're not going to solve it as a federal government. Uh, even though we're working across agencies like NOAA and EPA and the USGS, which is part of Interior, and um, uh, uh, the Ag Department, it's important that we have all hands on deck and that we work closely with other partners, and that's a big part of what I want to talk about today. So <clears throat> Department of Interior has a big hand in water in the West. Um, in the last century, billions of dollars were invested in infrastructure, and a lot of that infrastructure is under the stewardship of the Bureau of Reclamation, which is part of the Department of the Interior. Uh, other big water manager, largely for flood control, is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But you think about uh, Grand Coulee Dam, Hoover Dam, Glen Canyon Dam, the big ones that generate power and also manage water, those are Bureau of Reclamation along with over 400 others. Um, so we're very involved in this. And the investments have been traditionally in the past and not so much in the future. And we feel that now in terms of the lack of efficiency, uh, the leaks, as Dr. Holdren mentioned, uh, some of the other challenges that we have to our infrastructure. But nonetheless, we are the largest supplier of water in the Western United States, and we're dependent on by states, by tribes, by communities, agricultural and commercial users. Um, and uh, we also, it's part of our um, job to maintain healthy natural landscapes and habitats, which uh, also vie for the same water that everybody else wants right now. So we are investing in R&D. It's never quite as much as we hope in every budget year, but we are continuing to do some of the things Dr. Holdren talked about in terms of stretching our water supplies farther, being smarter about that infrastructure. And we're also doing a better job of measuring. So the U.S. Geological Survey, part of the Department of Interior, has been responsible for uh, over 100 years in things like stream gauges, which we all rely on, sometimes very low tech. I've seen them as I've been hiking and uh, along some of the waterways here in the east. They've been around for more than 100 years. And then, of course, uh, higher tech versions. But they're also using data from space to help us measure groundwater. Um, believe it or not, you can measure groundwater from space. Uh, they're helping us understand the dryness in the landscapes through a tool that measures evapotranspiration. So they're using science at every level from on the ground to uh, in the air to help us understand what's going on because you can't uh, manage what you can't measure and we've got to know what's going on on the ground. So USGS is a, is a big player. So Ben Franklin said, when the well is dry, we learn the worth of water. And I think that's very clear, uh, has been very clear in the last few years. Um, we are at a time of profound drought, as you know. I look uh, daily at the uh, drought in the United States, and the state of California was pretty much completely in an exceptional drought situation. That's the, the highest level of, of drought uh, situation we've had over the course of this year with just a little bit of easing up in the El Nino stuff that we've seen, but not enough, certainly, to change uh, a pattern. We uh, have the driest 16-year period right now in the Colorado River Basin in terms of the inflows to the river that we've experienced over the time we've had measurements of the last 100 years. And uh, we're in some of the worst uh, drought situation that we've experienced in the paleo record that goes back about 1,200 years. So um, we've got some very significant challenges, and you're all experts, so you could be giving this speech. Um, John talked about uh, impacts of climate. Too much water in some areas, too little water in other areas, tremendous variability. We've got population growth pressures. We've got pressure for development. And we have not invested in our water infrastructure in the way that we did in the last century, and it's uh, catching up to us. So they're having a real effect um, everywhere from really obviously California, but also across to Texas and in some parts of the country where they're getting too, too much water. And um, so we have a lot of work to do. I come from the Pacific Northwest. We had this giant reservoir is called snow and snowpack. Uh, that is not behaving the way it always used to. And even in the course of my lifetime, I see dramatic changes as I go through the mountains uh, in the Cascades. Sierra Nevada, uh, incredible to fly over there, as I'm sure many of you did over the course of the last year, and see no snow whatsoever. And Lake Mead, um, at its lowest level since it was being filled up uh, since the 1930s. 
So lots going on, and uh, we got to put a few solutions on the table. And I'm here to talk to you about a few of those. As you've seen, just represented by the three of us that have been at the podium so far, we're taking an all-in approach, and it's something the President has encouraged us to do. We are making strategic investments in science and monitoring, as I mentioned, with the USGS. We are managing the limited water supplies we have through being as flexible as we can operationally. And for those of you, any of you from the Bay Delta area in California? Okay, not too many, which is surprising. But uh, lots of tussles about endangered species, environmental flows, uh, salinity levels, ag north, ag south, uh, major, major water issues in California. And we have uh, seen that and been as flexible as we can, but um, you know, species and habitat and salinity of water levels are also really important, and that's part of our job. We also are partnering with states, with local governments, with nonprofits, and with the private sector. States, as you all probably know, have a major role to play, the major role to play, really, in the allocation of water within their states. Um, but rivers run across multiple states, Colorado River, seven basin states, uh, and you see this throughout the country, and actually we share it, of course, with uh, the country of Mexico as well. So I come from the private sector. Uh, most of my career, with the exception of the last two and three quarter years, have been in the private sector. And I know that uh, private sector, when faced with a challenge, can be pretty innovative in coming up with solutions. And so today I'm announcing the formation of the Natural Resource Investment Center. It will be based in the Department of Interior, but it will be uh, working across the federal family, very consistent with the President's efforts to reach out and engage with the private sector in innovative solutions. Our goal is to provide resources and information to many partners involved in, in water resources across the country uh, and to bring private sector, nonprofits, academic institutions, states and other stakeholders to the table. So how's it going to work? Um, first, we want to promote uh, innovative and financing instruments that will fund critical water infrastructure and can help stretch limited water supplies. And I'll give you a few examples, but when Mike's up here on the panel, you can drill in a, a little bit more. At the same time, uh, we want to think creatively as companies, private sector wants to develop our resources, we want to be thoughtful about how we mitigate that development. It used to be kind of site by site. We're now pulling up and looking at a landscape scale. So the concept of mitigation banks, I'm going to develop over here, it's going to have an impact, but the most important area to address conservation objectives may not be right there, it may be someplace else, and how do we facilitate that? So. There's kind of a three-part mission to this uh, Natural Resources Investment Center. First is to increase water exchanges and transfers. So one example I would give you that's been around for many years, and this has evolved over a great uh, long length of time, is the Central Valley Project in California. Uh, those who have senior water rights, those junior water rights, those with no water rights, have a method uh, through the Central Valley Project of swapping and trading and paying and following crops and investing in different areas in order to thoughtfully manage those uh, limited water supplies. So that's one example. Uh, second um, area we want to work on is increasing water infrastructure. So I'm going to use just a quick example there, and that is the Warren Brock Reservoir, which is uh, just north of the border in, uh, in California. We realize with the way water is coming, uh, not consistent with how it has in the past, as Dr. Holdren talked about, we want to make sure that we have the kind of storage capacity to, to handle that. So not having a robust budget like we might have had in the last century for infrastructure projects, the Bureau of Reclamation partnered with the states of California, Nevada, Arizona, and other stakeholders to permit and build within a two-year period of time uh, water reservoir storage uh, in California that would make sure that when we did have high flow events, we had an opportunity to capture that water from the Colorado River system. Um, third example, and this gets to uh, the concept of mitigation banking, I'm going to use Barrick Gold in Nevada. Barrick Gold is a large um, gold mining company. They uh, want to be able to expand their mines. They actually own a fair amount of private uh, rangeland, and they have made investments to enhance the habitat on that rangeland to bank credits that will then be used to offset the impact from their gold mining, which won't be in the same immediate area. 
in a different area. And we just worked with the state of Nevada to do some pilot work on uh, private investment supporting habitat on public land because 87% of Nevada actually is in public ownership by the federal government. So uh, while the barrack example is private, we will work with the state because we won't have sufficient resources to manage these um, landscapes in the way we'd like, but with private sector investment, we have a better shot at doing that. So three areas of focus, water exchanges and transfers, water infrastructure, and mitigation banking. So uh, I know Deputy Secretary Connor will get into a little more detail on uh, those as you get into more Q&A. But uh, in our regular day-to-day -day work, we also are uh, providing grants through the Bureau of Reclamation, and a lot of times those are matched locally. WaterSmart promotes water conservation and efficiency, and we've just recently announced $21 million in funding available in 2016 uh, to improve drought resilience across the country. I guess that's assuming we have a budget, Mike. In 2016. Um, we also are investing in advanced water treatment and desalination research and development. Uh, you know, as Dr. Holdren talked about, we use an awful lot of water. I mean, one could say waste an awful lot of water in this country relative to other countries. So being smart about how we use it to begin with um, is helpful. Reuse, recycling, some innovative things have happened, particularly in California on this. We want to see more of that. And desalination. <laughs> Uh, is a potential very energy intensive and you have to make sure that that syncs up with our climate change objectives as well. So we need to do research and that will make a difference. And uh, last on the measurement side, the USGS and the Bureau of Reclamation will be releasing an interactive web tool. Uh, it'll be coming out later on this week. If you go to usgs.gov, doi.gov, or the Bureau of Reclamation website, uh, it will be live. And uh, what that's going to do is um, take a lot of our open water uh, data sourcing to visualize uh, the 16-year drought in the Colorado River Basin. So you'll see um, water managers and users real-time data so that you can make better informed decisions about water storage release and so on. We're believers in open data and sharing that data widely, and we know that the private sector and, and other stakeholders can uh, make uh, excellent use of that and uh, take it to the next level. So. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here, for your commitment to water all over the country. Uh, we know the federal government doesn't have all the answers. We don't even pretend to. Um, but we want to be effective, efficient uh, partners with you, and we want to stretch every dollar you have with every dollar we have uh, to maximum benefit. And I think it's going to take some bold action, and it's going to take some collaboration, uh, because uh, we don't have enough water in the places that we need it most. And I think it's fair to say that when it begins to impact the economies, and we do see that in some communities, uh, it wakes everybody up. So uh, we look forward to a productive discussion over the course of the day. And I thank you all very much for being here and um, look forward to continuing to work with you. Thanks.